Israel punches well above its weight in all matters of statecraft. It sits at the intersection of Europe, Asia and Africa, thereby channeling high-impact international economic ventures. It has one of the most technologically advanced and capable military forces in the globe. It is allied with the world's premier superpower and it is a pioneer in sectors like agriculture, healthcare, startups and technology. But for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Israel is small, vulnerable and limited in resources. The country faces hostile neighbors to all sides, with the only friendly flank being the Mediterranean Sea. For over 75 years, Israel has existed in a state of perpetual conflict, each time facing battles that could have been its last. This stalemate, as disagreeable as it may be, is unlikely to improve anytime soon. The Middle East is an unforgiving place, a school of hard knocks. So, by means of military posturing, Israel reminds the periphery that it is capable, dangerous and willing to get its hands dirty. Coupled with its religious and historical significance to multiple faiths, Israel is key to regional geopolitics. And so, for all its features, it must expect the unexpected. Because in this part of the world, to stand out is to stand within the crosshairs. The geopolitical importance of Israel manifests in many ways, but when it comes to influencing public opinion, the media plays a critical role. News coverage of Israel can change drastically depending on where you get your information, and there's an increasing left-right divide on the issue, especially in the United States. This is why I use ground news to make sure I'm getting the full story. I've been working with them for a while and it is in times like these that the ability to quickly compare multiple news sources becomes priceless. Right now, Ground News is having its biggest sale of the year. You can get 40% off their Vantage subscription, the one I use to do my analysis at ground.news slash Caspian. Let me show you some of the features. This is the Ground News blind spot feed which surfaces stories that are receiving lopsided coverage from one side of the political spectrum. Here's a story, primarily covered by left-leaning news sources. Hamas-run government says Israel strikes residential buildings in Gaza refugee camp for the second day with many casualties. Days later, we get this story primarily covered by right-leaning news outlets. Israel Defense Forces say Hamas hides rockets in playground swimming pools. The first story highlights the perspective of Palestine's Hamas-run government, noting attacks on residential buildings and many casualties. The second story highlights the perspective of the IDF and claims that Hamas intentionally hides rockets in residential areas, perhaps trying to justify the attacks. If I were stuck in a media bubble, I'd only be getting one side of the story. You can use my link, ground.news slash Caspian, to subscribe to Ground News today to take advantage of their best deal of the year. You'll get unlimited access to their app, website and newsletters. Once you start reading the news this way, it's impossible to go back. The lay of the land shapes the hand that rules. This rings especially true for Israel. Three distinctive regions make up its geography. The first and most important is the coastal plain. Its length runs along the Mediterranean coast from the city of Haifa by the slopes of Mount Carmel to the outskirts of the Gaza Strip. Meanwhile, the depth of the coastal plain extends up to the Judean mountains by the city of Jerusalem which overlaps roughly with the boundaries of the West Bank. Interestingly enough, while Jerusalem is renowned for its religious and historical significance and is officially the capital of Israel, it is actually Tel Aviv that captures the spotlight. More precisely, Tel Aviv's metropolitan area, known as Gush Dan, is the epicenter of Israel's political, financial, industrial and cultural life. More than 4 million Israelis, or 40% of the country's total population, live in the greater metropolitan area. 
By and large, however, the core of Israel rests in the coastal plain. It doesn't just host the country's largest cities, but also its international airports, seaports, critical infrastructure and political institutions. The coastal plain, therefore, makes up the heartland of Israel. The problem, however, is the lack of strategic depth. At its narrowest margin, the coastal plain is only 14 kilometers wide, measured from the West Bank to the Mediterranean coast. And herein lies the origin of Israel's complicated and ruthless geopolitical reality. If the West Bank were outside of Israel's control, a concentrated push by a determined military force could split the Israeli heartland in two. The speed, surprise and ferocity of the recent Hamas attack is precisely the threat that can undo the existence of Israel. In the coastal plain, the loss of a single hill, corridor or plateau can have the harshest consequences, especially with modern weaponry. Missiles fired from the West Bank could reach Tel Aviv in a matter of seconds. There is no defense against such a threat. No amount of layers in air defense can secure a gap as small as 14 kilometers. This lack of strategic depth in its heartland is the single most defining geographic feature of Israel. It is the reason why Israel occupied the West Bank and is unlikely ever to let go, regardless of what international law says. Slightly to the north rests Israel's second most distinctive region, an area known as the Galilee. Known for its hilly and mountainous terrain, the Galilee features the Jordan River and the Sea of Galilee. The water basins in this region run deep and by use of advanced technology and sophisticated irrigation techniques, Israel has employed the local water resources to turn the Galilee into an agricultural and manufacturing hub. This remarkable transformation provides Israel with the necessary food security it so desperately needs. Not surprisingly, the Galilee holds enormous strategic value for Israel's economy. Without it, the country wouldn't be the same. A little to the north are Lebanon and Syria. They make for Israel's northern flank, with Jordan straddling along the eastern edge. In this densely crowded and hostile neighborhood, controlling the high ground is a matter of life or death. Legal or not, Israel controls the nearby heights, which gives it a tactical advantage over the periphery. By towering over its rivals, the Israeli army can stand its ground against numerically superior forces. For instance, from atop the Golan Heights, long-range artillery can inflict tremendous damage on any threat coming from Syria and Lebanon. The same argument is true for the other occupied heights. By controlling the high ground along the Jordan River, Israel can ensure the security of its eastern flank. So, although there is no legal validity to Israel's occupation of these strategic heights, without them, the state of Israel would be just one breath away from total destruction. Ergo, for the Israelis, a few angry resolutions at the United Nations are worth the strategic depth that the occupied territories provide. Remotely to the south is the third distinctive region, the Negev Desert. It is vast, arid and sparsely populated. The Negev hosts only two notable locations, Eilat and Gaza, both located on the outskirts of the region. At the southern tip sits the port city of Eilat. It is Israel's sole access point to the Red Sea and from there to global markets. Although Eilat sits outside the Israeli heartland, its strategic value is indispensable to the country overall. Its port allows the Israeli economy to bypass potential naval blockades in the Mediterranean should such a situation ever come to pass. Meanwhile, at the western tip of the Negev and adjacent to the Sinai Peninsula is the Gaza Strip. The terrain here is not dry, but Gaza falls under the same geographic definition nevertheless. The Strip is home to the Palestinians, with Gaza City marking its capital. The northern half of the Gaza Strip is one of the most densely populated places on Earth. However, the area holds little strategic value and so it serves as a place of poverty and neglect. The humanitarian situation is made worse due to the restriction imposed by the Israeli government, which wants to restrain the flow of arms into the region. 
Either way, as a result of this abandonment, extremist ideologies and militias have taken root in Gaza. To the dismay of many, including the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank, Hamas runs the show in the Gaza Strip. Elsewhere in the Negev, the region borders Egypt and Jordan, with Saudi Arabia located not too far away. The Egyptian front is especially worth mentioning, as the Negev Desert is directly connected to the Sinai Peninsula. The latter act simultaneously as a deterrent and a security risk. While the arid terrain of the Sinai has historically hindered the movement of armies due to supply restrictions, modern technology can overcome it. Should a sizable force cross through the Sinai Desert, it would have a high degree of maneuverability in reaching the Israeli heartland. This threat, moreover, does not exclusively come from the Egyptians. The Sinai is an area difficult to control, even more so than the Negev. And so, it serves as a shelter for heavily armed non-state actors. So, besides apprehensions over Egypt, the Israelis must also handle jihadists, smugglers and dissidents who are using the Sinai as a safe haven. Ordinarily, nations can resolve their security shortcomings by forming alliances or multilateral agreements. Compromises can be made so long as the intentions are sincere. For Jerusalem, however, friends are few and far, and whatever treaties exist would be annulled at the first sign of opportunity. Should any of the Arab nations sense weakness on the Israeli part, they would likely act on it. That is precisely what happened in 1948 when Israel declared its independence from the British Mandate. Egypt, Jordan, Iraq, Syria, Saudi Arabia and Yemen officially entered the conflict. In each of Israel's distinctive regions, worst-case scenarios unraveled. Egypt crossed the Negev Desert in the first few days of fighting. In the Galilee, Syria used the Golan Heights to bombard Israeli settlements before launching its own invasion. Meanwhile, the Israeli heartland, namely the area surrounding Jerusalem, was under attack by the Jordanian Arab Legion. Still, not all Arab nations taking part in the conflict were equally committed and the Israelis used that to their advantage. Through a combination of tactical excellence on the Israeli part and incompetence on the Arab part, Israel managed to secure an unlikely victory. However, that victory in 1948 was incomplete. So, Israel began a process of solidifying its borders and searched for other means of deterrence, such as its nuclear missile program in the 1950s and 1960s. However, the neighboring states would not let go, and they could not. At the time, the Palestinian refugee crisis had reached its boiling point and triggered a wave of pan-Arab nationalism across the wider region. All the Arab nations began boosting their armies, and a new round of hostilities seemed inevitable. In 1967, that conflict came true, and it spilled over across all of Israel's distinctive geographic regions. Egyptian forces crossed from the west into the Negev Desert, while Jordanian units launched attacks in Jerusalem from the east. Syria, meanwhile, launched artillery strikes against Israeli settlements in the Galilee region and Lebanon conducted air raids on Israeli positions in the north. As unlikely as it seemed, that war resulted in yet another decisive Israeli victory with Israel capturing all the strategic territories and heights, including the West Bank, Gaza and the Golan Heights. By doing so, Israel created strategic depth for its heartland in Gush Dan. But Israel's victory on the battlefield had also demoralized the Arab governments to such an extent that it ushered in an era of instability in the Arab world. In turn, this gave the Israelis even more breathing room and diplomatic flexibility. More importantly, the victory in 1967 opened the door for a strategic partnership between Israel and the United States. Prior to this, Jerusalem and Washington had casual relations, but the Soviet support for the Arab states in the Six-Day War pushed Israel closer to the American camp. This newfound relationship would go on to be instrumental in bolstering Israel's national security. However, Israel's newfound triumph came with strings attached. 
Some of the territories acquired by Israel in the 1967 war were not under Israeli sovereignty. Moreover, the newly captured Gaza Strip and West Bank were populated by Palestinians who were anything but loyal to the Israeli state. This created a new crisis for Israel, a crisis that has lasted to the present day. Some 3 million Palestinians live in the West Bank and 2 million more live in the Gaza Strip. In theory, a negotiated deal could see Israel live peacefully with its neighbors, including an independent Palestinian state. But theory is not good enough. The bad blood between Israelis and Palestinians runs deep, so much so that it is unlikely to fade away with the stroke of a pen. The Israelis believe that even if a peace agreement is signed, fundamentalist rhetoric like from the river to the sea will persist implying a complete Arab takeover of Israel. After numerous existential conflicts with its neighbors, Israel is unlikely to let go of the strategic heights surrounding the West Bank. Mistrust isn't the only grievance preventing a peace deal. Even if both the Israeli and Palestinian leadership took a leap of faith and agreed to a negotiated peace deal, regional powers like Iran could still employ non-state actors to ruin the peace. It would be as easy as smuggling in weapons and provoking a false flag crisis. From the Israeli perspective, the Arabs and the Iranians can't be trusted. Therefore, conceding the occupied territories such as the West Bank and the Golan Heights would achieve nothing but leave Israel exposed and vulnerable to military threats. Ergo, to ensure its survival, Israel places trust in weapons and geography rather than treaties and promises. Stemming from this, Israel is willing to violate international law and pursue a preemptive policy so long as it achieves whatever strategic objective it deems necessary. The occupation of the West Bank and the resulting subjugation of Palestinians is the outcome of that unfortunate geopolitical duality. But Israel cannot let go of the West Bank for strategic reasons. Initially, Israeli policymakers dealt with the issue by encouraging the establishment of Israeli settlements in the occupied territories. By changing the demographics and placing Israeli civilians in certain areas, Tel Aviv sought to cement its control over the territories, regardless of their legal nature. Under this approach, Israel designated certain regions of the West Bank for Jewish settlement, which is how Area C came into being. All Israeli settlements in the West Bank, all 127 of them, are located in this tightly confined space. Area C is now home to some 450,000 Israelis, but when also accounting for the illegal settlements, the Israeli population in the West Bank could be as high as 700,000. Either way, roughly 60% of the West Bank falls under Area C and is directly controlled by the State of Israel. However, since Israel has not formally annexed the West Bank, Jewish settlements in the territory are not considered by Israel to be under its sovereignty. So to exercise its authority over the West Bank, every five years, Israel renews emergency regulations to legally extend Israeli criminal and some civil laws to Israeli citizens in the West Bank. This way of slow, incremental encroachment into Palestinian territory is aimed at breaking the contiguity of Palestinian population centers in the West Bank. And by systematically disrupting Palestinian contiguity, a viable Palestinian state becomes less and less viable. On the other hand, Israel's settler program fuels violence and impedes Palestinian access to their land and resources. Moreover, it harms the negotiation process for securing a two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So much so that in recent years, Israeli lawmakers have prioritized the one-state solution instead. However, Palestinian birth rates are much higher than the Israeli stats. This is how the population pyramid looks like as of 2023, and this is how it looks like for countries of similar income. Israelis cannot compete with these numbers. So, even when employing the one-state solution, Israel will face a rapidly growing Palestinian population within that calculus. The future of the West Bank is uncertain. 
The Israelis believe they'll cross that bridge when they come to it. One thing we do know, no fix will meet the terms set by both sides. Overall, Israel is like a fortress under siege. It enjoys a strategic relationship with the United States, which empowers its diplomatic, economic and military elbow. At the same time, grave dangers lurk in Syria, Lebanon and the non-state actors that reside there. The only way to hold the fort is by towering over the competition. Israel needs to control the nearby strategic heights if it is to exist. Deoccupation is possible, but only in areas of lower elevation. Going back to the exact 1967 borders is practically impossible. Doing so would subject the Israeli heartland to devastating rocket and artillery barrage and risk splitting the country in two. In light of this, for the Israelis, the tactical and strategic edge offered by the occupied territories more than makes up for a few disapproving resolutions at the United Nations. Small in size and vulnerable, Israel's future is shrouded in uncertainty. Every so often, sparks turn into flame, conflicts go hot, and the country is thrown into uncharted territory. But the Israelis are cut from an old cloth. Their secret weapon is that they have no place to go. And so, they might as well put up a fight. I've been your host Chirvan from Caspian Report. So if you haven't yet subscribed, now is a good time to do so. Just remember to click the bell icon, otherwise you'll still be missing out on our latest content. Thank you for watching and Sarol.